So I'll introduce myself. My name is David Jacobson Lonkel, and uh, I'm an artist and writer and educator. Um, I I met Pat as a student uh, and knew her for the better part of the last decade of her life. Uh, became quite close with her, and uh, during that time, uh, became very well affiliated. She was one of the major inspirations for me um, as I was developing uh, my into an artist uh, and my interest in it. I really, Pat uniquely resonated with me and um, as she did with many people, uh, she became a very well-known, very well-known particularly for her, her teaching skills and her ability to connect with students. Um, and so this becomes, this will play a fairly significant part um, in any description of Pat as we move forward. This lecture in particular is going to be about uh, my, upcoming, my upcoming digital publication for Pat, uh, the mock-up of which for the book cover can be seen here, titled The Inspired Pat Basil and the Courage of Art. And how this book came about is towards the end of her life, uh, I began to have the idea that um, Pat was somebody who uh, was is really subject to some of the obvious injustices of uh, historical you know, being left out of her historical place uh, in the 20th century art world. Um, and uh, there is a lot of reasons for this. Um, one of the primary ones is that she, in a lot of ways, represents an ideal uh, of an artist who was uh, really dedicated and completely focused on developing herself as an artist, working on her painting, uh, and eschewing the interest of careerism and attempting to try uh, to find a larger place in, uh, or a more prominent place within the New York art community. Uh, instead, Pat really ended up focusing an enormous amount of energy over her 60 year career, just painting and developing her skills as an artist, developing her philosophy and understanding about what art is uh, and the artist position within the world. She, um, this became a major feature that is, ends up being uh, um, uh, shown in the publication. After, so I began this process uh, and let her, uh, before she passed, but um, what happened is after uh, Pat passed in 2011, um, she, there was, I was put in, I, I was uh, one of the people that was put in charge of organizing and uh, uh, looking through the ephemera that was in her, her building. And there was an enormous amount of paperwork um, that was covering, she kept basically everything for, uh, um, for all of the years that she was around. And gradually, uh, the initial idea was just to print out uh, some of the writing that she had that she had given to students. There was a couple of period times where she had writing specifically for students. And by the end of her career, she had put all of this writing into a small little pamphlet. And I thought, well, I would go around and interview people in the art world that she knew uh, to, to kind of bolster this and publish that. As I was going through all of this other paperwork, increasingly more and more items of write, of her own writing, of interviews that she had conducted with people over, over her career began to pop up. And, uh, and so I began organizing all of these items into uh, the format that is going to be uh, a part of the publication. The initial, initially, uh, I was going to have it published through Mid-March Press, uh, through Pat's lifelong friend, Cynthia Navaretta, who was the founder of Women Artists News uh, and a major, uh, played a major role in the women's art movements of the late 60s and 70s, um, and was very interested in being able to publish this for Pat, but it ended up, things got rocky, and so now it may have been a blessing in disguise because uh, I'll be able to have a publication for this that is much more image rich and is uh, and uh, is far is much better able to convey 
the range of Pat's oeuvre uh, across her career um, in, in a format that will be much more accessible at this point. Um, one of the features, yeah, so the book will contain foremost, as I said, some of the writing to her students, but the writing is broken up, the, this writing to her students is broken up into two different sections. The first being the writing that occurred towards the end of her life, the end of her uh, career as a teacher um, over the roughly 10 years that I knew her. And the other section is at the very beginning of her career as a teacher, where in the early 70s, she began teaching a seminar class, a kind of intensive class with students uh, that in which she would exchange letters to them uh, and addressing a lot of personal issues, um, personal items that were occurring in the discussions that were going on in these classes uh, and um, how they relate to the painting, like personal concerns. So they, are all, they all have this, this very intimate relate, uh, uh, quality to them as they delve into all of the nuances and complexities that come out of learning how to create an image, uh, understand what art is, and, uh, and get to grips with, with what the possibilities are in this kind of endeavor. So the book itself will, be, will, be, uh, will probably have quite a, a, a large appeal to educators and students, um, but it also has a lot of writing uh, through the perspective, through Pat's very sensitive perspective, um, perspicacious attention to the ongoings of the art world. And she was somebody that was present in, in a somewhat unique way, uh, being very young uh, when she first ends up on 10th Street, uh, which I'll get to in a moment, uh, and being uh, associated with with uh, with the artists that became particularly well known over the fifties in New York, so there's a lot that is ripe for consideration uh, in the potential of the of this writing here. And this picture on the front is uh, taken by a friend of hers in 1958, Jesse Fernandez, who is the Cuban photographer and artist. Um, and here is Pat in her studio, or one of her studios. She ended up having three studios on 10th Street uh, between. Third Avenue and Fourth Avenue, um, and if you look here, there's this painting here, which we still have. There it is, score for a bird. Uh, this I'll just leave up for a moment, just so you can see uh, where she was at this time in her development, or as she was painting, what her considerations were. Um, I'll get into a little bit more about what we're looking for and what we're looking at when it comes to these paintings. But first, I'd like to thank, there's a few people to thank, a few organizations to thank. First of all, in support of this lecture uh, is a grant from through the Department of Cultural Affairs that was granted to this project through Staten Island Arts. So thanks for Staten Island Arts. And uh, thanks to the Milton Resnick and Pat Pasloff Foundation uh, and everybody that was there. Um, who has been a continual support to this project uh, in its ups and downs over, over this substantial duration. Uh, all of the images that are in this lecture are courtesy of them. Uh, and any images that are not of Pat um, are, uh, are found through open source. Uh, and then a special thanks to our moderator, uh, my wife, Tammy Geisler. So this, this, uh, this quote here is one of Pat's, she had mentioned to me, this was one of her favorite uh, reviews uh, to describe her work. And I think I'm just putting it up to give you a sense that uh, it captures a little bit of her character to show that this was something that she was particularly fond of uh, as, as a description of her, um, even though it contains a lot of a kind of, kind of paradoxical statement, um, as you'll and so this painting I put up as, if you're not familiar with Pat's work, this is an image that is uh, done at, uh, that was very significant for Pat. Uh, she writes about it and some of that's included in the book. And it was something that was around the time of a turning point for her, um, uh, right around the millennium when she's doing a series of paintings uh, that kind of, are, are, are part of what's known as the poet series. And I have several of them here because they align very nicely 
with uh, some of the writing that I'm going to represent but and, and how she taught her students, but also because it really is the, the kind of uh, uh, joyous vitality, this, this sustained energy that this image is able to convey uh, even through a screen is really indicative of the kind of work that she's doing towards the end of uh, the last uh, couple of decades of her working. Um, so. so here is uh, a picture of, uh, from Willem de Kooning. Um, this is from his 1948 Charlie Egan show. And I put this up because uh, Pat's early development in, uh, in her pursuit of art starts, starts really very young, certainly in her teens, where she has some references to the fact that she was attracted to different artworks that were in, uh, in magazines and the like. And she ends up going to Queen College where she feels quite dissatisfied because they only actually have something like an art history program uh, and she's sort of trying to invent a studio program for herself uh, within the confines of this institution. She's not really satisfied with the faculty there and their outlook. She doesn't, she's looking for somebody that she really connects with. And when she sees this exhibit in 1948, um, she, she, she's really blown away by, by what she describes as de Kooning's uh, or Bill's high space. Um, this kind of this vaulted quality that she was experiencing in the work, and she sets out to look for him. Uh, she didn't know who she didn't. She was not connected to anybody at the time. She's only twenty years old, and she ends up uh, filing for a scholarship. She, she one of the key uh, uh, anecdotes that she would bring up to to give a description about how different the art world is now from when it was then is that around this time she looked up in uh, the yellow pages all of the different colleges that offered studio art programs of some kind, and they could fill one page. Uh, so this was prior to, um, uh, prior to the return of, uh, 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 prior to the return of veterans from World War II, um, and uh, the increased interest of artists, uh, of, of, of a large portion of the general population to pursue different kinds of artistic pursuits uh, that really generated a lot of the art programs within the country. And so she ends up uh, uh, being awarded uh, the scholarship to Black Mountain College. Um, uh, and she does so, it, and it just so happened that uh, uh, there's stories about this that I won't go too much into, but it just so happens that she's able to run it. She, she just finds, de Kooning, she finds um, uh, Willem de Kooning and and uh, they connect, and she's only there for that one summer in 1948. Uh, so here's a picture on the left of Pat uh, and de Kooning and his wife, uh, Elaine de Kooning. And uh, uh, de Kooning is 20 years her senior. Um, uh, so there's this, and this, this kind of picks up, he's, he's, he's closer to the normal age of a lot of the artists that she's going to be engaged with. Um, during the 50s, so she's very much younger than the majority of the group that's there. Uh, and here's just an image of, uh, of a Joseph Albers class in Black Mountain College. I think it's just a particularly nice image. She wasn't especially fond of the Albers class, um, but she appreciated the environment there and she felt deeply indebted to what she ended up discovering uh, while there. So when, uh, when de Kooning and Pat return to New York and uh, he helps her set up a studio on 10th Street where she and, and a couple of other artists that came from Black Mountain College begin to have uh, individual tutoring with, with him. And he begins teaching them in the same vein of uh, education, the Flemish kind of draftsman school that he learned himself in the Netherlands. Uh, and so here's just an example of, of uh, Pat's facility with line. She had a, she, she was a, a very adept uh, craftsman. Um, and so you can see there's a, there's a kind of classicism to this that uh, 
uh, is quite impressive. Here's another image of this period of time. And this image, I think, in particular, uh, is, is, is really characteristic of Pat as a, as a person. Uh, and so what I recommend to everybody to kind of get a sense of, of what I mean by this is you try and hold your hands in, in the same way that the uh, hands in this image are. Um, you can see that there's this kind of Baroque intricateness to, to this, to this, this uh, almost balletic pose. Um, and it's then drawn with, uh, with, a, with a very classical uh, and fine line, um, but it still has a romantic quality to it. And all of this, all of this really uh, captures um, some of Pat's, how she's thinking about the world, how she ends up thinking about uh, the use of paint in, 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 um, in its complexities and intricacies. Uh, and some of her character as a person that um, you have this that, that kind of quality. I think this is one of these early images that really captures that for her. So this image, while she is while she's learning uh, with de Kooning and he's teaching her what she complained of as the six H um, uh, drawing exercises, mostly of still lifes and and other figurative items. Um, she is also trying her hand at the so-called, this kind of de Kooning style, uh, where, uh, these different forms are, are juxtaposed and interwoven, uh, in the space of the canvas. And what strikes me about this is the, is that Pat, this is in 1948, uh, Pat would have just met him. So this had to have been done in the fall of 1948. And she just leaps into, uh, this this exercise of trying this out um this these these abstractions out and there's such a confidence and there's such a confidence to this image and such a complexity of different types of forms it's not it's almost immediately she's not just iterating uh what she's seeing elsewhere she's she's developing it and 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 uh finding her own sort of style within it uh so that it, it has a real presence and a real acknowledgement. Um, uh, it really, really uh, brings up qualities of Pat's character within this as well. Here is the other item about this, to put it into some kind of context. And a context that was very significant to Pat is that uh, during this time, now not by fifty six per se, but certainly in forty eight and certainly prior to this, uh, the notion of a community, the notion of an artist community, was really significant to her. And for many of these artists, uh, there the idea that abstraction could be something that that was possible, that you could make an image that didn't have figurative elements in it was still. It, it, it was an unknown to them. It was an uncertainty. And despite the fact that all of these artists are engaged in this activity, engaged in an activity of exploring this, there was a large, it, it felt it was really important that it was a kind of communal activity to some extent. Um, and only later on do we start to have the uh, uh, this breakup, this idea of the community breakup, an individual artist really attempt to uh, uh, establish themselves as particular founders of some novel or original style. Um, and this is something that Pat talks quite a bit about in the book as well, and had spoken about in person, um, that in order that to do this and to have that as a as a goal, as a as a model for behavior, to to pursue originality for its own purposes, uh, was something that was outside of it was it was outside of the actual purpose of engaging in this artwork, that art was contained within a community and that community was nested within its own culture and that these things developed over time, um, even though each individual artist adds their own uh, uh, distinctive mark to it. So here's Pat in the middle, if you didn't spot her. And uh, this is in front of the other uh, interesting feature about 10th Street. Here's 10th Street and here is 3rd Avenue. 
Um, and here's where you could buy guns at the time. Uh, and the other item is that uh, most of the artist run galleries uh, at the time were right on this small little block. Um, and if you went right across the street from here to this side of the, that, you would go into a building uh, or right around this side, there was one of the buildings where Pat's, uh, one of Pat's studio was uh, during the 50s. Um, she was an original member of March Gallery as well, which was one of the galleries around here. And so this idea that uh, artists were a part of a culture, were a part of a collective, uh, that there were items about individual artists that everybody was, was interacting with one another uh, and informing one another's work and that no one artist really kind of explodes into, uh, as she would say, uh, out of Zeus's head as Athena, um, that, that novel uh, and original work is something that develops gradually over time. This was a key feature of, um, of Pat's thinking. And one of the ways that she expressed it was to always kind of point out the artist that didn't really, she felt didn't really get their due. Uh, and, and Arshel Gorky was one of the primary uh, members of this, though Gorky has since, I think, acquired a bit more recognition um, for his, the role that he plays. Um, Gorky and a few other artists like Soutin um, were key figures that, that, uh, didn't, um, that Pat felt didn't really get uh, uh, enough standing within the canon. And, um, and that was also an item of her character. Uh, you can see the relationship of an image like this to what you might think of as the so-called de Kooning style as it comes to be known. Um, and that really Gorky, in fact, played the role of mentor and friend to de Kooning for uh, almost 20 years. Um, so that kind of relationship that uh, uh, was, was prominent during this time. And towards the end of the 50s, I think she begins this project in 1956 and then eventually uh, has an exhibit in 1957 um, uh, at the Poindexter Gallery. This is the catalog for the 30s um, that Pat organized. It was something of her brainchild and put together. Uh, and this was to highlight the fact that uh, many of the artists that she was speaking with really felt that they were indebted to many of the uh, indebted to the artists of the 30s, and that a lot of the uh, a lot of the acclaim that was registered to the abstract expressionists uh, emerges from the difficulties and the struggles that were occurring with artists from the 30s. And I'll just read a uh, I'll read an excerpt here from this, uh, from Pat. She goes around interviewing many artists uh, for this exhibit to get their thoughts on it. And all of this is, uh, has been transcribed in the book as well. But here's Pat. During my visits, visits to all of these other artists, uh, I was made sadly aware of how much work was lost or destroyed, how hopeless the intervening years were, and how little awareness there was that there could be a day to remember. So this, this lamenting uh, of, uh, of, of what becomes lost is something that is a really prominent feature of, uh, of the New York art world. And it's something that gets picked up on even of the artists that were on 10th Street. And she continues, people have fitful memories and are going back. Why should this work be interesting? It is close to us. And so that captures some of the notion that uh, she she maintained for the duration of her life, um, and Cynthia Navaretta, who was also a part of this community, uh, shared a simple, similar similar uh, recognition of this. That she, you know she was somebody who was out on the street very frequently, going to exhibits and was a, was really involved in the art world. And she said that she would often over the over the course of her life she. Uh, would often see uh, artists who were really remarkable and 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 uh, uh, were important to many people, and see that their families were unable to keep their work and would just kind of toss it on the street. And these people are simply lost. Um, so this this kind of lamenting of what is lost is a is a feature, uh, and I think something that was a little bit haunting to Pat. So working within this idea of um, a bit of what I was mentioning before, but within this idea 
of art being a part of a culture, uh, one of the key play ways in which we get to abstraction, uh, and here we have a couple of the artists who are fully a part of the canon and not really lost, um, Picasso and Matisse, uh, if you're not aware of how we arrive at some of these issues in abstraction, a simple explanation to kind of enter you into this uh, notion is that for, in fact, it, it, there's, you could argue that for almost 100 years prior to the 50s, um, uh, figuration and figurative elements in artworks had begun to dissolve. And you could see by the time we got to the 30s and the 50s, uh, the figure had dissolved so significantly that now items and features of the actual process of doing the artwork begin to take prominence. And the artists of the 40s and 50s that begin to develop abstract expressionism are picking up on some, uh, picking up on the fact that this was a realm that could be explored. So if we look at, for instance, here the uh, in the Matisse, we have that shadow of a face, which is known as the pentamento. Um, uh, this now, instead of just being something that would be covered up to have a more finished look to the image becomes a feature of the aesthetic possibilities that are within it. And these kind, this kind of, uh, uh, development in painting is something that becomes a significant part of Pat's art, uh, and even of her process. And here we can see just a couple of examples of other artists who are also engaged in this activity. Here's uh, an image of Pat's. Here's Helen Frankenthaler's, uh, probably her most famous piece, Mountains and Sea. And here's just a Diebenkorn um, sketch uh, all around a similar time period and how a lot of these artists are engaged in a kind of similar activity of exploration, uh, each doing it with their own, each applying their own kind of qualities to it, but each, but each in a similar starting space. Uh, to take that idea further, there's also a lot of artist couples uh, during this period of time, probably most famously are Pollock and Krasner. And we could see just an example here of how they are dealing with the same sorts of issues. Um, but significantly for Pat, Pat, uh, Pat was one of these artist couples having married Milton Resnick uh, in 1960. And here we have a portrait uh, by Alice Neal of them the year prior. Um, and interestingly, a couple of their images done in 1948, uh, again, at this time, it's possible that they did not even see each of these images um, when each of them was done. Uh, and yet we can see how each of each carries uh, uh, a lot of similarity, but then has their own kind of character to it. And Pat would talk quite a bit about how the qualities that make an image original and specific to a person um, were things that were not direct, they were not pre preconceived, they were aspects about how the artist was actually engaged in the work. And I show these examples to kind of give an idea about what she might have meant by this, uh, because I think it, a lot of this emerges out of this time and becomes lost uh, within the 10 years afterward. And it has since, uh, it's since been a notion that in, in another form of, of uh, uh, historic injustice is sort of lost to time um, where, where people look down on artists who, uh, who, who show any kind of resemblance to other kinds of artists or the wrong sorts of artists. And, uh, and I think Pat is somebody who, um, who suffers from this kind of stigma. So here's a, a quote by Pat to kind of, convey some of this. As for giving up the past, everyone yearns to fly, but holds on for dear life. No one wants to repeat the past, nor is it possible or good to undo one's origins. The solution being to build on the past rather than pretend it's not there, digest it and make it your own. And this image in particular, uh, this is another one of those images that uh, uh, Pat had this up. Uh, if you entered her building, you went up the stairs and at the this, the, what would be the third floor, but the first flight of stairs there from the entrance. Uh, you opened the doors and you entered into her studio space and right in front of you was this image, uh, which I think also really captures Pat's, uh, this kind of romantic classicism uh, that she had and uh, that, that, that is indicative of some of her work and indicative of her personality in a lot of ways. 
And at the same time, her remarkable facility with paint, um, such a complicated and subtle image that it has developed here. So a little note that I add just on, on my own, from my own perspective, um, and I kind of developed this after seeing the, uh, her retrospective at Black Mountain College in 2011. And uh, as, a, as a means of kind of exploring and experiencing Pat's paintings, uh, I like to think of them, you know, perhaps exhibits of her work and, and each work individually as, as, as gardens of paint. Uh, that these are places, you know, when you go into an exhibit that is that has a bunch of Pat's works in them, it's as though they have each these garden rooms. And then particularly within each image, uh, there is the tableau of the image that is like so often brilliant, uplifting and striking uh, as it would be if you're seeing a, a you know, a garden in full bloom. Um, and then as you let yourself settle into ex experiencing the image, new visual events emerge uh, that are each individually just as exciting as perhaps that first experience. And I like to say that um, uh, uh, when you can look at an image for a long time and it just keeps giving back to you, that it has good legs. And, and Pat's, Pat's work uh, never gets tired for me. I'm always able to find something new, uh, find some new experience, some new little thrill, some, some uh, uh, exciting feature about her work, uh, regardless of how long I've looked at them. So here's a, here's a really key idea uh, in this theme of, of uh, understanding how, uh, trying to understand what, what Pat is doing, what her idea is uh, to understand her work. And this key idea of, of there being an aesthetic emotion, right? This is something that she promotes. It's that there is a an emotion that is specifically dedicated to uh, to aesthetic experiment, and that it's not the same as there being uh, a sense of a painting being joyous or, or or happy or angry or as she says here. Um, and this played a, a substantial role in her teaching. Uh, where she was describing, she would describe leading with a concept. So the layperson concept might be, or the common concept might be that the artist has some brilliant idea and then executes that idea. And, uh, and we judge the quality of that work by how well it evokes uh, a sense of what that idea is supposed to convey. Um, and far from that, Pat's thought is that each artwork is going to be a part of a, a a way of discovering, a way of exploring, a, a way of exploring uh, what is possible in this particular uh, emotional space that is contained on the canvas. Uh, so she she gives recommendations like to uh, cast a net of paint as if you are a magical fisherman onto the canvas, and then you work from this. You work from uh, within this uh, array of brush marks that you might just toss down onto the canvas. Uh, and to find different, uh, find different uh, aesthetic possibilities within this and go step by step uh, until the painting begins to develop itself in this process. So I have another thing here uh, that I'll read in description of Pat's uh, educational outlook. And this, this is something that I think conveys an idea about how Pat was approaching, uh, approaching teaching art um, and, uh, and what was really important to her. So I think this comes from, this comes from a description, uh, for her seminar classes, uh, in the, uh, in the early seventies. This course is in the paradoxes of art. It can be called experimental since there are no courses similar to it. It is meant to jolt students out of the, con out of a conformity, which is putting all that is vital in them to sleep. Its theme is from Yeats. Only that which does not teach, which does not cry out, which does not condescend, which does not explain is irresistible. At the same time, it profoundly contradicts itself by discussing at length all the unutterable issues of art. And then I include here uh, 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 from another section um, that she says, the content is by no means to be thought of as comprehensive, rather as a temporary guidelines intended to keep students from falling into chasms of incoherence. Uh, so 
this gives you a little bit of a, a, a scope of understanding a, a few of the quotes that I'm going to bring up and which compose uh, half of the book uh, is her writing to students and, and descriptions about, about what to do in art. So some of some, oftentimes these descriptions are technical, but couched uh, in a personal philosophical um, uh, uh, kind of mode so that if she gives a description like this, find ways to listen to your painting and small visual events will occur, which cannot be imagined or conceived and certainly not predicted, as is necessary in making attempts at creating interest always look forced and false. And so there, there are a number of these um, types of, of recommendations, types of descriptions about what kind of place to the the student or the person learning art places themselves in? So there's a kind of energetic space, a kind of mental space uh, that is optimized for for developing an image. Um, and a lot of the descriptions that she gives to describe a lot of descriptions that she gives to help students uh, work on their images and find new things and put themselves in a place where they can create original work that is indicative of themselves uh, are in this vein. So you won't know what lies ahead or where you're going, but you will know something about where you are, how you got there, and the next small step, which is all you need to know. And so here, um, here we can see how at this point, uh, we have one of these poet series that I mentioned and Pat has uh, a painting which on the face of it appears to be readily preconceived, right? There's this, this interlocking diamond grid pattern. Uh, and if you didn't know anything about the work prior to this, you would assume that the notion of it was to have this grid pattern in some kind of visual, uh, 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 visual experience that was associated with it. But if we look in closer at this image, um, we can see that she probably started this off, some of this plum uh, coloring that's beneath here, and some of these darker blue lines, this kind of Prussian blue that's on top of this. These were probably a few of the first lines that came down. And the idea to have this sort of grid pattern in the way that it is, was probably suggested by those initial marks that she puts down. The other thing that's noticeable is that you, this, this space here uh, and some of these spaces here are, are essentially, are almost bare canvas. So this is, this, this kind of is showing the kind of virtuoso uh, uh, capacity that Pat had to, for, for her paint handling, uh, the likes of which is on par with any artist of the 20th century. What she can do with paint um, is, uh, is so adroit uh, and adept to uh, adeptly sensitive to what's happening on the canvas, um, whereas most other artists like myself will struggle uh, 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 trying over and over to try and uh, connect the way the paint is working to produce something marvelous. Pat, uh, much like the idea of how those hands are interlocked, can is working in such a way where she's understanding this process of the painting. Um, the possibilities in how she's entering into that space with each brushstroke uh, and doing so with a facility that is just kind of breathtaking. The other thing that you start to notice uh, when looking through this is that um, every one of these shapes is, is unique, uh, is its own. Um, it is not just kind of procedural. Anything that was like a systematized approach to painting was something that was anathema to Pat. Uh, and, and every single brushstroke is important. Uh, this, was a, this was a really kind of key idea that as you put all of these marks down, every single one counts. Um, and there are going to be marks even within the marks that are slight modifications of just how the paint is sitting. Uh, and this is bringing the image to a kind of ripeness, a kind of interaction with itself uh, that develops from uh, this process of intensifying the artist engagement with each piece. So here's another example. 
and another description. So the painting uh, is evidence, tracks a vessel. The worth of a paint, the worth of paint and canvas is to the painting as the body's worth in chemicals is to the spirit it carries. And so Pat had this other notion as well that um, uh, uh, intensity doesn't come in a bottle, she would say. And so what makes the image interesting, what, what gives the image its vitality uh, and its quality um, and its impact on its emotional impact on the viewer is dependent on the artist and how the artist is engaged in the process of developing the work. And so the majority of the recommendations that she's giving are about situating the individual, situating the student in a place where they're able to uh, be sensitive enough to the type of type of uh, events that are occurring in front of them, such that uh, such that um, there there tends to be a kind of discomfort, but also there tends to be there has to be a kind of uh, impassioned um, dialogue with the actual image, much like you might consider uh, how a writer uh, is trying to compose. Uh, how words are sitting within a sentence uh, and finding just the right arrangement. And this is a process that's moving forward or how a, a musician is trying to understand the, um, or trying to develop uh, 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 a interaction with how their instrument is performing. Uh, Pat's work really uh, arises to the very cream of the crop when it comes to her facility with the paint and her facility with, with the medium. And so here's one other notion. Um, so there's always something about the last picture which nags, which cries for further development. And that is the next step. And so this is just one more element to this where uh, not only within the image, not only is a lot of the description about how to work on the image, how to, uh, uh, concerns about how to position yourself to artwork as production within your within your whole life. Um, and then of course also uh, recommendations, potential recommendations for how to move on from one painting to the next. And of course, none of these are to, are, um, are just uh, uh, are, are solitary and absolute in any way. But what you can see in this image is these kind of squiggles. And if and you could see the date here in 1998 to 99. And so just after this, she probably uh, uh, painted this painting. And you could see in the pentimento of this image or the pentimenti of this image that there are these similar swiggles that are going on beneath the image. And so as she's uh, putting that down, she's starting off with the same motif that she ended with in the, in the previous one. And you could see this in many other examples that she works on. Um, she is then responding to the visual events that are occurring on the canvas. She's responding to a few compositional elements that she's looking at. Uh, and each of those step-by-step, -step, uh, uh, each of those uh, brushstrokes step-by-step -step inform further on what the painting is going to be until it ends up in the, in the condition that it is as an original image. And so uh, I'll end with this, which is something that she wrote towards the very end of her life. And this is only a segment of it. The entirety is included um, in the publication. And, uh, but she, she really kind of struggled with the idea of perhaps of, 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 of writing this list because again, she was against this, this mode of systemization um, and this idea that there should be some process or checklist that the artist goes through but that there would be guidelines uh, uh, that might help the artist along their way. And here's, a, here's just a segment of it that captures some of the notions that I've been describing. So one, you know, handmade art by the hand of the artist was, was important to see the hand of the artist and this idea of, of the artist's touch uh, and, how that, and how the artist develops their ability to interact with the materials that really captures what is uniquely special um, and captures uh, what is potentially rich about that potential, uh, about that work, whether it's regardless of what it's in. Uh, the inspirational item, the builders on oh my God tradition. And for her, certainly she saw the abstract expressionist as a part of that, as part of a culture, a part of uh, uh, a lineage and a history. Um, 
a lot of Pat's work I can compare to, and, and we, we had conversations about how it relates to, uh, how painting relates to different eras of tradition, going back, um, going back to the caves, uh, authenticity, yes, yes to influence and inspiration, uh, uh, to be against trends and careerism and the originality proof and brand X, um, be against the kind of conformity, which might seem contradictory, but this sort of idea of the paradoxes that are ex extant within the process, within this idea, within art itself, uh, uh, as, as a part of the kind of, um, the kind of balancing act that the artist is engaged in. Uh, how do you exist within that paradoxical space? And that that is a sort of entry point into, uh, in, you know, in into the rabbit hole, as it were, where you can find something, you can discover something that is both uniquely your own and perhaps speaks in a deeper and more significant way to the culture as a whole. Um, poetry, the eloquence of paint, stone, clay, and wood. Um, and, and features like this, I think that this characterizes and gives you uh, an overall sense about who Pat was, uh, uh, what her work uh, looks like. Um, and, uh, and there's just much more of this uh, to come in the publication. Uh, hopefully it should be within this year and uh, digital publication that will be made available. So thanks to everybody. And uh, that concludes the lecture. This is a little uh, drawing that Pat did. Um, there was a period where she was doing some illustrations, commercial illustrations. And uh, this was for um, a Greek themed uh, publication of some kind. Yeah, go ahead. I found a, uh, a pad of 30, some 30, pencil drawings that Pat made of her carrier pigeon, Morgan. <laughs> uh, some of them are really quite lovely. So uh, Tracy and me were, were thinking of an idea for a small show on the third floor of Gold Morgan, which would, uh, would be a nice little, uh, nice little show. So we're going to see if we can put that together. Uh, I think I... This this uh, this was of course at the because uh, uh, you guys are everybody's moving the work from the storage facility, and uh, I think I remember finding these in her studio. Uh, they were found at the same place as um, the drawings that she did under de Kooning's tutelage, uh, and they were really packed away deep under <laughs> under everything else. Those in, may uh, be, in a folder. Those might be separate because this is an actual pad. Yeah, um, it, it, there. Uh, but I, I know. I think I know what you're talking about, which we can include also. Those are a bit more developed. These are really just little light pencil drawings. They're quite, quite beautiful. Some of them are very abstract, actually. Uh, anyway, just... yeah, there was one included, I think, in the uh, Black Mountain College show, and. Uh... I think it's in here. Yeah. Are they like this? No, that's I think uh, ink, isn't it? That that's an ink. Uh. Yeah. It. Well, it might be. No, there's oil on it. It's on yeah, paper. This is just little pencil draw. These are pencil drawings, but no. Oh, okay. I, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh. Well, it sounds it sounds exciting. It sounds. There's Thirty of them. Are there's quite a few. So. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds great. Donna had a story that she wanted to share. And also, I've opened up the chat so that everyone can chat openly as well if they felt so inclined. Okay, to speak, David. <clears throat> Hi, Donna. Hi, how are you? How are Hi, you? Everyone. Thanks for coming. Thanks. Thanks for thanks for hosting this. This was absolutely wonderful. It was just uh, it's lovely to see all of her work um, contextualized and, and and placed in in time and space in terms of art evolution. So so thank you, David. You did a fine fine job. Um, I just thought I would share a really short personal story of Pat, if that's okay. Um, 
So it's 1981 and um, I'm entering college as a freshman and I go to the St. George campus and I decided I'm going to take an art class. I'm going to take a drawing class. And so I walk in to the art studio in the St. George campus, which is before your time, David, so you don't have any sense of what that was like, but it was this wonderful big space with lots of natural light. And we had gotten a list of things that we needed to, to have for the, for, the, for the class that day. And I really thought, oh my, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be an artist. I have to get, you know, I have to bring in a sketch pad and I need charcoal and I had this list of things. And I walk in and I'm very, very green um, in terms of life and everything else. And so I walk in and I, and I place my, my, you know, my sketch pad and everything on the easel. And I'm all excited about what she's going to teach us. And before she actually walks in, a gentleman walks in. And I'll never forget it. He was in a, a burgundy robe. This is how traumatizing this was for a 17-year-old. A burgundy robe. And I could see that, I mean, he's got no pants on. And he's got curly long hair. And I went, wait a second. I'm in a drawing class. What's going on? And all of a sudden, he takes off his robe and he sprawls himself out onto the, onto the, uh, the stage and in walks Pat. And she's basically giving us directions, start drawing. So she walks around as people are drawing and she comes over to my mind and she makes some, you know, some, some suggestions. And she comes back again and she said, excuse me. She goes, he has a body below the navel. <laughs> and I just thought that was so Pat, right? That is so Pat. Um, anyways, I went on and took a number of classes with her in both drawing and, and painting. And, um, and I just love the fact that she, um, she never made a big deal out of anything. Everything was expression. Everything was freedom. Um, um, she guided you to the best of her ability in terms of, uh, of, of what she could offer to, to, to give you a sense of like where maybe your, your work should go. But there was a sense of, it was the only space where really you can just be ex fully expressive um, without, um, without judgment. So I think that was really Pat. So thank you for letting me share that story. Thank you. Yeah. It's always, you know, it's it, with, um, so I, I had a unique kind of, comparatively unique experience with her because I, I, I never, I had never met Milton. I knew her only during the time uh, uh, after her husband Milton passed. And so my, my viewpoint on, on Pat was, it tends to be a little bit different from uh, the majority of other people that were very close to her. Um, and uh, because I was, I, I didn't have that extra uh, juxtaposition with him. Um, and so what I find is there's there's quite a range there's actually quite a range of, of different opinions about uh, uh, what her teaching was like and who she was like as a person, um, and I think that just uh, that's just a feature that I wanted to add there at the end to give a sense because I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that uh, you know th th what happens to the to the history of somebody uh, is it becomes kind of fragmented and, and different people. Uh, keep adding on their own experiences and uh, and what emerges to the top as as the key ideas is is something that is mutable over time. Thank you. Anyone else? And has his hand raised? Uh, yes, it's just an observation here. Um, as you're giving this lecture about this artist was very experiential. Many of the paintings that you're showing at the end are of the poets. And I think that's an interesting thing that you're the overlay on the experience, which is sort of mirroring what you're doing in this event itself, which is, which is very interesting. Uh, yeah, I, it, it's, I, the, the talk could have easily gone on for, for, uh, several more hours. I had many other slides from other areas of her career. Um, and I ended up falling on, um, uh, relying on a lot of the poets to kind of, uh, the poet series to, uh, 
to give explanations about the, the quotes that I ended up keeping. Um, it is, it is a, a lot of them are some of my favorite works of hers. So uh, that's, that's probably the main reason why they're there. But the dynamic is totally appropriate. I mean, that, that's just the observation that as that's happening, you're, you're, you're dealing with that outer layer and yet we are experiencing what's underneath. And the, the things that you're referencing, it's just like it's, it's a mirror to the, the life that we're experiencing with her painting. Um, there was mention of, of the, the, the birds. The bird does appear often in the work. I think the first work, it references the bird. And that, that and you also, the word fly was in one of the earlier quotes. So there is that some, that, that transcendent mechanism, which is, uh, uh, which does appear in the art. Um, we talked about the, uh, the the 70s and because that's when she begins teaching, I think you say. And because what happened to many artists at that time, the 70s, we had this, this change from this group experience, which you talked about. And then we went into the age of narcissism and uh, some people... They, they dropped out of that. And that would correspond to what you her thoughts about careerism and everything else that was going down, that 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 where would you find community? You find it with in the education and working with students. And uh, so that, that that sort of like fits into the uh, the life that she was living. And um, to, to, as as an artist as you are and who can forget your burnt painting um there's some there's a life in her work that that must be inspiring in terms of of of, of the work of other artists as the students i mean is that something that you experience because you're in the presence of all this stuff happening and you talked about the the that one long paint that panoramic painting that there's so much going on that you're challenged to be part of that life. If you're going to be a painter, you have to have that life. You have to engage with that life. I mean, is that was that something the experience that you get from her as a student, as an artist, in terms of like being in her presence and what her work also communicates? Uh, well, so again, I think for me it was that was something that was. Definitely, that that this idea of the intensity not coming in a bottle—that um, what you bring to it is what ends up being on the canvas. That the, the artwork is a vessel; you're filling it with something, and what are you filling it with? And what you're filling it with is essentially yourself. It becomes a mirror of who you are in ways that are um, beyond your cognition or beyond your consciousness, um, and really only become developed over time. She described. The experience of doing an artwork, which is this kind of feedback mechanism of being in dialogue with seeing uh, what's happening as a unique experience, as something that was really special with regards to, uh, uh, she wouldn't have said self-development, but special with regards to, um, it's you may do this type of thing in writing where you go back and you read your work or you do other types of activities, but in artwork, the response that you were able to interact with, it was an immediate one. And that was really important to her, that it was instantaneous. The minute that you put a mark on the page, you're experiencing something about yourself that is beyond what you're even aware of. And getting in tune with that was very important, uh, was a very important thing to do. And so it has this existential weight to it uh, when you're when you're considering it in that in these terms, um, and it could be quite intimidating to think of it that way. And at the same time, talking about this idea of the paradoxes, there's a whole uh, uh, letter, lovely letter that she writes in the '70s, where she's talking about how art is just a diddle, and that uh, there was a student who refused this idea that only wanted to think of the art as being really monumental, and that's what made it valuable. Um, and that really the kind of accidental thing that pops up on the canvas uh, uh, was was just as often as anything where the where the most beautiful, the most potential, the most indicative quality of the work emerged from. Uh, so yes, 
uh, this idea of it being uh, something that you really had to invest in uh, was was a major part of of the education. Uh, I have a question about what it was like to be in a class in terms of the interaction with her and how alive that was, and how in terms of you talk about these these each individual brushstroke. I mean. What was it like to be in a class and interact with her as you're as you're painting something and she is there part of the dialogue? What was that experience like? Well, uh, for me, it was extraordinary. Um, there was there was there was nothing quite like it up until I uh, ended up in her class, and uh, it was intimidating. Uh, she could be very intimidating um, and demanding. Uh, but, but very early on for me, we, we got along quite well. And so, uh, a lot of the scales of that intimidation fell off and by the end of, and, 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 uh, it was as though, you know, it, it was as though the communication about painting was something that didn't occur directly. It was, it was about just kind of what was important was to guide, like it felt like she was trying to guide me to a place where I was able to see what I was doing and be in a place where what I was doing um, became more clear rather than, and she, for me, one of the reasons, so she, she started writing the, the diatribes because I had so many questions and uh, she was basically, uh, she thought that the, the talking about it wasn't going to help. Um, and so, so when we did kind of hit on a few points where I seemed to understand what she was getting at, um, uh, we were able to build on that, um, uh, over time. And that was incredibly special. Uh, and so it, you, we got to a point where you didn't have to talk very much to understand what was, you just would point and you would show something and you would suggest something and a few words satisfied. Um, over time, uh, but I write this. I write about this a little bit. Is that uh, uh, the way that she looked at a, the way that she analyzed a painting, the way that she saw a painting was was it was incredibly insightful. It was as though she could see right through the person mm. by seeing what they were doing in the painting, uh, and she would say something to the person that had to do with their outlook, their persona. Uh, rather than any kind of technical feature that was in the painting in order to try and help guide them to a better place to be. Um, this wasn't always true. Sometimes it would have been as simple as, you know, make that object a little bit smaller and then it'll fit into the place more. But what really stood out to me was her ability to uh, see the character of the individual uh, through the way that they were making the painting. That was really remarkable to me. Francisco has his hand raised as well. Hey, thank you. Oh. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, yes. Welcome, Francisco. Thank you. Congratulations. It's just a marvelous presentation. Uh, what, I, what I was thinking, David, uh, as you were presenting and as some of the questions just came up, is that, yes, in fact, she was you know, a member of an artistic community, but she was also a member of an academic community. Right, which was Richmond College and the College of Staten Island. And I know, uh, having been at the college for 25 years and knowing people who had been there longer than me, that there was always great respect for Pat. Right. So I'm sure that she ventured outside of you know, her um, artist department to uh, integrate with faculty in English, sociology, history, etc. And it would be interesting to know what people felt about her, right? Not just her students, but her colleagues felt about her, right? I know for a fact, uh, Morella Afrin, who was at the college for many, many decades and served as Dean of Humanities and Social Sciences and then was provost, who thought the world of Pat. I mean, she would just praise Pat and, and go out of her way to make Pat's life easier right at the college. So. It would be an interesting kind of addition to the student's perspective, what colleagues in, a, in an academic uh, community felt about her as an artist. Because I think I always felt that when people mentioned Pat, they were just all in awe of her and great respect for her. 
yes. Well, she she. I think one of the most striking things is when uh, when when people felt they people end up feeling very dedicated to Pat. I mean, here I am, ten years later, and I am still trying. You know, I'm still pursuing this course of putting together her writing um, to to share. Uh, in a publication, and like it's it's been a lot of up and downs to uh, uh, to get to a point where I feel like um, I'm getting fairly close to being able to do that. And and she uh, she engendered a, a lot of um, a lot of very passionate dedication to her um, through. For me, it was it was often through the fact that I you know I feel like she elevated my ability to exist in the world, uh, which is really the whole function and key of going to uh, of academia. Uh, and she was a very dedicated educator. Uh, she spent a lot of time um, thinking about her students. And this is something that comes up in some of the interviews as well, that uh, one of the first things that she would always bring up to her friends whenever she was speaking to them was, was mentioning what, what her students were doing. So this was something that was on her mind very often. Um, and, uh, it, and I think that this, this, this led over into uh, many of her colleagues, not all of her colleagues, but many of her colleagues. Um, she, was a, she was a strong personality. That sense of idealism, her uh, idea, ideas about community were formed in the late 40s when she first came upon the New York School. And that kind of sense of community and idealism was based in the fact that no one could get a show. <laughs> it was the gallery system was closed to painters like Pat. Uh, when she met Bill de Kooning in 1948, he had just gotten his very first show at, at the age of like 45 years old. And hardly any of the people she knew were showing. So that sense of community was 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 grounded in in the fact that it was not competitive commercially. When it did become extremely competitive and commercial, when the galleries started to open, the commercial galleries, and people were tripping them over each other to try and get into a gallery, uh, Pat was kind of able to recreate to some extent that ideal world in academia. See, so there was a kind of a transfer from, from, from her view of the art world of what the art world should be ideally, which never existed in my experience at all. Uh, but of course I came into the art world in 1973, not 1948. So she saw it at its very beginnings, where she sensed kind of a purity based in poverty. Everybody was poor, nobody could show, and everybody supported each other. And that I think that she found some approximation of that in the academic community working with her students. And um, so she was able to some extent to recreate uh, to recreate that world at least to, to her satisfaction because I know that Milton kept telling her to quit. Oh, get out of there! You don't have to teach. You should be painting. You shouldn't be dealing with those kids. Mm. You're wasting your time and all of that, you know. But Pat didn't feel that way at all. And the other only last thing I wanted to add, which is a bit unrelated, is Pat had a lot of interests. She was very spread out. There was art, of course, and there was teaching. But you know. She, we, we packed 20 boxes of books just on the American Indian that went back to like 1840. Uh, she was involved, even though she was a very articulate and rational person and extremely intelligent, she was a big practitioner of astrology. And I don't know where she got that from, but I suspect it was from that gypsy family that moved into her building. Uh, back in the 1950s on the first floor because she made very close friends with, with the family and the, the matriarch of that family was a, um, a fortune teller. 
<laughs> so I'm wondering whether that's it. Our... Might have been. She told me once. I think her she name told me once, and, and that that does ring a bell. And and um and then she began taking classes. Yeah. In it, uh, she she ran off. She was like, and I just signed up for the most uh the the most advanced class that I could find. And oh, I said, you know what you're doing, and she just said, yeah, and then. She was extremely. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, this was at the beginning, but it was also yeah. a kind of um, a lubrication because she was fundamentally a shy person, and uh, so astrology was a way of kind of making friends. So as soon as she saw a new person, she'd say, "I'm going to make a chart for you. When were you born? Where were you born? What hour?" And she'd make a chart, and of course that broke the ice. So it served her very well socially. Um, yeah. So it served that, that probably the purpose. So there was the Indians, there was the astrology, then later the Tai Chi, also her ability to integrate with the Chinese community, which mm. did not exist when she moved to that neighborhood. You know, when she first opened that, uh, when she first got that place on Forsyth, it was 1963. There were, it was more like Jewish to, to East and Italian to the West, and there were no Chinese. And then it became Chinese. And Milton, just shut himself away from the Chinese community completely. And Pat opened herself up to it, started to exercise in the park with Tai Chi and made a lot of Chinese friends and all of that. So it was just kind of an interesting dynamic there. And there's so many aspects to her, even just putting the painting to the side for a while. But uh, quite a story, really. Yeah. It, yeah, I, I do mention a bit of that, of course, as, well, as you know, in the book, there's that she had a huge range of interest. And a couple of the things that I was playing around with pointing out here is that the, the um, you're you're right that uh, uh, this this idealism, this idealism was absolutely key. And Pat, I, I learned this actually through her teaching me astrology, that she saw that like if you had that in your chart, then you had a special gift that really made it possible for you to be a great artist. That the idealism was vitally important to her, and the idealism of the time, being that she, I, I think that that the year of forty eight was so influential to her and so formative to her. She must have been just exploding uh, in her as a twenty year old, and I think that just carried through for the rest of her life. She was. Con she had a conviction uh, that this was the right way to be, um, and that you know, and that, and and she says that it breaks apart by by the time that the uh, uh, the uh, Pavia's uh, Eighth Street Club has their opening in the fifties. So this idea of an artist community, as she saw it as being, you know, as you say, somewhat pure, somewhat uh, where there's a connection, that disappears within a couple of years after she's there, and during the fifties and up through. Uh, the rest of the rest of her career, she has this kind of lamenting sense that it is disappeared, and it comes out sometimes in some of her interviews where people ask about the art world, and she says, "What art world? There's no such thing as that any longer. Well, it, was it used to exist. It was a function of yeah. poverty. That that community was 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 based in the fact that no one had anything. No one. Yeah, had and I think that certainly." Yeah, and I think that's more so the case. I, I think she was probably so young yeah. that that wasn't what was she was picking up on. Everybody was twenty years older than her, right. and so they're they're functioning, trying to gather together to make something of themselves. And she's seeing it as as this kind of immaculate place where everybody's working on this issue because they're all talking about issues about painting. Uh, and uh, and she's coming in kind of naive, but she never loses. There's a kind of courage to that conviction, I think, uh, that carries through her painting for the entirety of her life. It it's an interesting aspect of her. It's an interesting feature of her as an as an artist. And she wasn't a drinker, and they all were. That whole group were alcoholics, and Milton barely yeah. got out of that. And he only got out of that because his doctor told him, if you don't stop, you're going to die. Your liver is already a problem. Uh, and she made Well, him she said that's the reason. I'm sorry. Go ahead if you had more. No, you go ahead. Uh, she, she said that was, that was the key reason why um, she uh, broke up with de Kooning, why, why they, were, they ceased being close, uh, was his drinking got so out of hand by the mid-50s. 
Um, and that was really the start of it. I know it happens a little bit later on in a more kind of uh, absolute way with, you know, they stopped talking really at all together. Um, um, but she said it was by the mid fifties that uh, his drinking got so out of hand that it, they didn't want to be around him anymore. Yeah. It's right around the time that she, she gets closer to Milton. There's, a, there's a, something of a trade-off. I would, I would just like to add something that you have to realize that when a lot of her ideas were formed in 1948, when she first came around, the art world, as she told me, was comprised of approximately 200 people. And then she would add that that included the framers. <laughs> so that's amazing. And I know it's true because I heard Irving Sandler say the same thing, although he said 300. So I mean, obviously you see, it was a very small place and it was a community. And it could be a community with 300 people, as opposed to now where there's like probably 300,000 artists in Brooklyn alone. I mean, it's, it's, it's so unwieldy now, the art world. And I think that yeah. you know, she felt that she was a subversive and not part of the mainstream, uh, certainly by the time I got to know her in the 1970s. And her relationship to academe was very interesting because Probably she didn't believe that the college was the best place to be studying art. And if she was more principled, no. I think I heard her say, she wouldn't be teaching there. Because it really didn't fit well, in. She, yeah. It was at odds with, with the principles of a laboratory and logical thought and other things that you had to master for your, your degrees in other subjects. So yeah, that's uh, an, interesting, an interesting thing to look at. Yeah, I came away with the thought that art was essentially an anti-academic activity um, and uh, from studying with her. And, um, the, and the this is artists, as a person who I'm deeply interested in academics. There were so, art historians that I worked yeah. with at the college that thought that she was telling her students not to think. But of course, she wasn't saying don't yeah. think. It was a different kind of thing. But that was the right. big issue always. Right. And also, yeah, over of, the years, there was a whole, well, over the years, you have to realize, uh, I was a witness to her teaching at the very beginning of her career there, all the way through. Uh, it changed, and her um, ability to allow students to do things was um, much looser at the end than it was at the beginning. She was much more doctrinaire, and much more strict in the beginning. Um, and her own work changed as well, of course. So. You know, it wasn't a it wasn't a, a steady thing. It it um, was malleable. So that's also another thing to look at. You know, you're looking the, the examples of her work that you're using are from pretty much the end of her career. Um, the poets, for instance. So yeah. Um, you know, there there were other other styles, other other things she was interested. Yeah. In. There's just limitations to time. Yeah. Um, as as a part of that, but certainly it, 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 there's a quote in it from Cynthia Navaretta, uh, and she would argue with Irving Sandler: Was it 110 people or 125 people in the art world? And that's so it's a similar kind of idea that somehow gets passed on. And uh, it being possible to be a small community, it's you know it's, it's it makes me think of like you know is it is it possible to have a, a nation that's 300 million people? large or is it just that an idea of a nation has to be something that's more like a few thousand like a city state in order for it to be cohesive um and there's something there's something in that idea that is uh that that makes sense you know you, you start to lose sense of uh, who you're affiliated with or who you're connecting to or who's a part of the community when it gets beyond 300 people i think th i think the um the the number that they throw out there the archaeologists throw out there now is that our brains evolved to uh, be in a community of something smaller than 200 people. Uh, and then once it gets beyond that, you begin to lose track of the people that are there. And it's, makes sense. It aligns anyhow. Sar had his hand so, raised as well. I'm not sure if he... Thanks. Uh, it's just because I'm in a train uh, right now. I didn't know if I could still talk. Hi, Hi. Nice to How see are you, you? you David. Okay. Nice to see you. Very nice to see you. Nice to see you, Craig, Tracy, and 
Jeffrey. Uh, wonderful to have this uh, opportunity to remember Pat and get to understand aspects known as Julios uh, as we, at the very end of her life. I think five years ago, and I met her in Vermont when she came with you, David, uh, as a guest artist, and Damien give a talk, and I, I like to say something that also pertains to what has been shared by Jeffrey in regards to the Chinese community. And whether I'm not Chinese, I'm originally from Peru, I felt um, very much uh, blessed to met her. She basically, uh, basically uh, and only knowing my work. Right? And, and, and then, um, uh, this relationship continued developing until she uh, left us. But, um, and so I would say that she not only as a, was an amazing, incredible genius artist, but also she was this incredible human being, as already has been said by several of you. And, and she, she, in a way, I think was ahead of her time to see what's going on there, what was but still going on, of course, and as it's inclusion that's happening now, she was doing that already before this was in the, at the center of the debate, right? And I was uh, blessed by that. I mean, I, I know it by my own experience. She actually, when I was uh, just arriving in the U.S. with nowhere to go and, and, and needing much help, she was the person who helped me the most, I think. And so... Um, and, and of course, as an artist as well, I mean, uh, uh, when you, I mean, uh, myself, I mean, I, I, I'm a strength as a sculpture, and so I didn't feel necessarily, and I was doing installation and other things, and I didn't feel necessarily that she could probably understand maybe what I was doing, or, you know, I was kind of limited in that sense that I didn't quite, at the beginning, saw her reach. But as I got to know her, I, I found that she would have insights in works that would not have anything apparently, I mean, at least apparently have anything to do with what she would do, right? She would they give, they give me very important uh, feedback on sculptures or conceptual work, uh, installations. And that was really to me a surprise. When I didn't get to know her, when I was starting to know her, I even remember the time when I, you know, but I was going to shock her when I told her that I was going to make these, I was making to involve sex workers and where I was going to teach art to sex work, workers, basically. Basically. And basically she told me, actually, they would be good artists, <laughs> she said, right? <laughs> so she went a step ahead to understand the idea and the project. So uh, uh, the fact oh. that we are here I'm the only person in the car. Yes, it's a very fascinating night here. So I'm uh, really yeah. blessed. I, I feel blessed to have met her. I think that she still blesses. I feel blessed until now. When I teach, I often try to remember the way she, even though I was not her formal student, I feel in a way I was a student of hers in some, to some extent. And uh, and I, when I work with uh, painters, which who I teach now sometimes, I try to remember what... Um, her way was uh, to engage and to to let us always uh, leave things open, right? And I think that's really what has been at the center today. Like we're still very much not remember her as someone who has uh, left us, but someone who is still with us. Um, we have left as many questions to still uh, work on. Not that they have an answer necessarily, but still to keep us busy. Anyway, that's all what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cesar. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, part of what's uh, coming across in this, and, and uh, yeah, she Pat was uh, incredibly versatile and uh, was a, was different for many people and had a huge, as I mentioned, there's going to be a range of different considerations. Um, and of course, this had to be limited by, by uh, the constriction of the talk, but I could teach a whole course on her after the work that I did just for, just for this lecture. Um, and if there's anybody else that would like to have uh, perhaps one last thing to say uh, before we leave, we're getting onto the hour and a half mark. Um, 
uh, I think I think that'll we'll have one last person have an addition, and if not, it's okay. Go ahead, Mickey. Hello. Since I see you, thank you so much. Hello. Oh no, now I'm now I'm yellow squared. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, I thought my two comments were inappropriate, but it's come around that maybe they weren't. Hands struck me as about the energies below the navel. Uh, well, perhaps. <laughs> I don't know that that would have been a thing that she would have. She was. Pat was. Um, I don't uh, need to have Pat prove it. It's certainly come up a number oh, of times. Well. Um, and the other was that <laughs> yeah. Crane and some of the other poet series, Crane struck me as a quilt. Um, then going closer as you took it, it certainly looked like weaving. It looked like a close-up, a microscope of, of a weaving. And that question of hand seems very powerful in the work as well. It, it ends up being uh, these inter, interwoven brush strokes um, ends up being, and, and it ends up being in the form of the painting actually, so that she has these grid or suggestions of a grid that develop over time. Um, and as I was saying, they, they kind of emerged from this, or probably emerged from this process of one painting to the next and this casting of a net, as it were, this kind of looking for what was happening um, within uh, a structure, within this structure of, of uh, brush working. Um, so, so uh, she she would comment that uh, she liked she she thought it was funny that the Chinese uh, friends of hers that would come to see her exhibits would try and look for the Chinese astrology meanings in those paintings, uh, so that they have all of the I Ching uh, letterings. And she said, you know, it didn't have anything to do with that, but it it related to other forms of um, visual description, uh, and that was something that that was a part of her thinking anyhow. Yeah. Uh, so anyhow, I thank all of you for coming. Uh, this was lovely to have so many people here and, um, and I hope that uh, you found it all a benefit to you. Um, and I hope to see you all very soon.